Hey everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we have another fun top 10 to do, and today is top 10 epiphanies that I've had while doll collecting. And so an epiphany is when you have like a realization about something, and these are 10 realizations that sort of hit me at one point or another about the things um, that I like and that uh, I want to do in my doll collecting hobby. So without any further delay, let's jump right into it. Number 10 is the epiphany that I had that I'm actually a doll collector and I think everybody probably comes to that realization at some point or another when you actually say, hey, I'm a doll collector or I want to be a doll collector. For me, it happened when I was very young, so I don't remember if I was 10 or 11, but I had this doll. This is Big Doll for those of you who are new to my channel. Um, she is a Cameo Cupid doll that used to be a um, mannequin at a store that my grandma worked at. And anyway, she was one of my favorite dolls and we went to, my grandma took me to an antique shop and we took her in to have her appraised. And like I said, I was 10 or 11 and the lady at the antique store said, you know, she looked at me and she said, you like dolls? And I said, yeah. And she said, she looked at my grandma and she said, she's going to always be a doll collector. If she likes dolls at this age, she's always going to be a doll collector. And that has always stuck with me because I felt like um, I always loved dolls. And I think I've told you guys before, like I have always considered myself a doll collector starting at that age, but that gave some legitimacy and some validation to me, I think, to hear somebody, you know, that worked in the collectibles field and that knew a lot about dolls, you know, look at me and look at this doll and she could tell the love I had for the doll and the care I had for the doll and just saying, you know, if she still likes, if she likes dolls like this at this age, she is always going to collect dolls. And was that lady wrong? She was not wrong. So anyway, I think that's, that's kind of one of those epiphanies. And one of the cool things is with this channel, one of the big things I've wanted to do is draw people into this hobby. So I want other people to have the epiphany that, hey, I'm a doll collector too. And many of you have left me comments that have said, you know, I've always kind of thought about it, but watching your channel, I really went and got my first doll. So that's very exciting to me when other people come to that realization that, hey, I love dolls and I want to be a doll collector. And even if you just have one doll that you really love, you know, you're a doll collector, even if you just have one doll. And so I think that's really, I think that's really a cool realization to come to um, that you are actually a doll collector. My number nine epiphany, um, it probably hit me a few years ago as I was collecting ball jointed dolls. And that is that I really prefer mature dolls as to versus child dolls. And I think that I've probably always had that preference. I really loved Chrissy growing up. So this was my mom's Chrissy, but I actually played with her a lot when I was growing up. Uh, you know, she was one of my playthings, even though she was before my time because she was my mom's doll. I had Barbies like most kids my age, you know, um, and Barbie's a more mature doll. Now I still love, I have a lot of child dolls that I do still love. I just have a natural preference towards the mature dolls like this Twiggling. And I do have some BJDs that are in the younger age range, but again, my preference leans towards a more mature doll. Now, as for baby dolls, I actually do not collect any baby dolls. I just, they're just not for me. And people ask me that a lot. Um, do you, you know, do you collect reborns or do you have baby dolls? I just don't, that's not, I don't like that age category. Cause one of the fun things for me is doing the wigs, which, you know, babies barely have any hair. Um, doing the clothes, I'm not into baby clothes. I like the more mature fashions. And so it's just something that I've kind of realized over the last few years, if I'm buying a BJD, I should probably lean towards a more mature one rather than buying the more childlike ones because I do prefer, slightly prefer the mature dolls. Now I still love like my American Girl dolls. I still love my Nikki Britt dolls, my Nikki Britt BJDs. They're, you know, they're a little younger. I love, I mean, I have a lot of BJDs that are, are, that are on the younger side and are less mature. But if I had to pick a preference, I do skew a little bit towards mature dolls. And that's sometimes something that you don't realize till later, you know, as you collect dolls and you get dolls in your collection, you know, you'll start to realize what you really like and what you really bond with when it shows up and the things that you, you may, might not like or bond with as much or things that you don't play with as much. So for example, I change 
my mature dolls a lot more frequently. I change their wigs more frequently. I change their clothing more frequently because it's more fun to me because I like those more mature fashions um, as opposed to the younger kid fashions. So anyway, that was one of the epiphanies I had is that I do my preference skews towards more mature dolls. Number eight epiphany is that I am not an in the box doll collector. And I don't know when I really had that epiphany, but it would have been when I was younger. So I'm gonna give you guys an example. I got the Queen of Hearts, Bob Mackie Barbie. When I was young, I got her for Christmas one year and immediately I took her out of the box. And my mom was like, why did you take her out of the box? And I said, cause I don't want her if she's in the box. I want to take her out and look at her and enjoy her. Now I had other Barbies like the Happy Holidays Barbies and some of the Hallmark Barbies and Great Eras and things like that, which I left in the box because one of the things that all the doll magazines and different collectible sites, not sites because there really wasn't internet back then, but the different avenues that I learned about collectibles was that you know you should leave things mint in box. And I never liked having those Barbies just in a box on the wall. And the Bob Mackie Barbies were just so sumptuous and they're just, I wanted to open them and enjoy them and touch them. And I opened her right up and my mom was like, you know, she was a little freaked out that I had opened it. And I was like, well, mom, you know, well, mom, I don't want it if I have to leave it in the box. But anyway, so I've never been, like I've never wanted to be an in the box collector. This is even with vintage dolls. So like I bought these Magic Nursery dolls mint in box off of eBay and early in my YouTube days, I did a gender reveal party for them. So if you really want to go back into the archives of Allison's YouTube, you can check out the gender reveal parties that I did for the Magic Nursery dolls. So even if I buy a vintage doll mint in box, my intention is to open it. And because of that, I very rarely will buy a vintage mint in box doll because I understand that there are collectors that do want them and they want to leave them in the box. An example of that would be like the Kenner Blythes. I've seen some Kenner Blythes that are mint in box and it's just so tantalizing to think about getting one and doing an unboxing of it. But I, I just can't do that because there are too many other collectors who would want that doll in the box and to leave it in the box. And that kind of stock is dwindling on those dolls. So I try to shy away from doing that. The Magic Nurseries, I didn't because the only way that you can do have the full experience with the Magic Nursery is to get one in the box because you want to find out if you got a boy or a girl and find out you know what kind of clothes they came with and stuff like that and so with Magic Nursery you have to take it out of the box if you want the experience and that's what I wanted I had wanted to relive the experience from my childhood but I will almost always not buy vintage dolls mint in the box because I don't want to open that box. If it's something that can't be opened easily, like the Chrissy dolls, their boxes, the top just comes off and you just take the doll out. And so it's not like the Kenner dolls that are shrink, have like the shrink wrapping around them or whatever, but I'm just not an in the box collector. I don't want to leave my dolls in the boxes. I feel like they're suffocating if they're in the boxes. So I feel like I have to get them out of there. And that was something, like I said, that I realized early on, probably back, probably back about the time I got this doll, is that I don't want to leave my dolls in the boxes. My number seven confession is that uh, Barbie's body never really bothered me. Now, a lot has been made about Barbie's uh, insane proportions over the last, I mean, as long as I can remember actually, people have talked about her body and I'll never forget the Time Magazine cover when they came out with the curvy Barbies and it was like, can everybody stop talking about my body now? I can't understand why there are concerns about Barbie's proportions, but it's just something that I never thought about as a kid. It's not something, the only time I ever thought about it was when I would see it come up in the news when they were saying it's given, you know, kids poor body image and things like that. That's something that I was never affected by. However, I love that they have come out with a diverse range of body types. So you've got your tall Barbie on the end here. You've got the curvy Barbie, which I absolutely love. I love curvy Barbie, especially the curvy made to move Barbies. Oh my gosh, love them. And then they came out with a petite Barbie. I want them to do a petite curvy Barbie, because then she'll be like me, because I'm petite and curvy. But, you know, it was just something I thought about one day. I was like, you know, it's, and, and actually it was probably when that Time Magazine cover came out and when Curvy Barbie came out and they were really, really talking about it in the news. And I was like, you know, Barbie has never bothered me. I always looked at her as a toy and, you know, as such, it, it just, 
the only time I really ever thought about it is when I saw it in the news. Again, I do understand how it could affect body image in a negative way for some children, but for me, it was just something that, you know, I'm very lucky, I guess, that I've always been very, um, I've always had good self-esteem, I guess, and I've always felt very secure with myself, even when I ballooned up, because I, this past year, there's been a little bit of ballooning, because I've been staying inside and eating, but, you know, it happens to everybody, so, um, I just, you know, it was just interesting when all that went down and I just thought, you know, it's never bothered me. However, I love, I absolutely love that they are trying to do more representation and they are doing more body types, um, at Mattel now. So that was just an interesting one that I wanted to bring up to you guys because when that happened, I had that epiphany, like, oh, she's never really bothered me, but I can see how some people would be bothered by it. Number six on my list is that I'm not a backstory person. And what do I mean by that? I mean that a lot of the things that people love about dolls, especially BJDs, but in do about dolls in general, is that they can create their own custom characters and they can give them backstories and they, they can build this whole world around this one character for one doll. For me, I have never been much of a backstory person. My story attached to my dolls is usually the sentimental way that I got the doll or what's special to me about the doll, but I actually usually don't give my dolls a character. One of the exceptions I have is this doll. So this doll, her name is Rafaela. She is an American girl. I think they call them truly me now, but she, uh, my backstory for her is that she is a Costa Rican girl and that backstory was easy to come up with because my husband is Costa Rican and I had her um, I had a Costa Rican uh, fashion design student make her a wardrobe. So this is actually made by a Costa Rican fashion designer and she has a few other pieces. And so she is one of the few dolls that I actually have a legit backstory and I have some authentic accessories to go with her and some, I've taken her to Costa Rica and taken pictures with her, but just very few of my dolls I do that with. And this doll was really inspired. I used to spend a lot of time on the American Girl um, on the AG Playthings board. I used to, cause I used to really, really, that was my main focus was American Girl. And I would spend a lot of time on there and there was a user on there and I cannot remember the user's name, but they created their own version of a Hawaiian girl. This was before Nania was out. I think it was when Kanani had just come out and they wanted a more um, vintage Hawaiian girl. And so they were creating their own. And I thought, you know, that would be really cool to build a character, but I wanted to build a Costa Rican girl um, because my husband's Costa Rican and you know, we travel there a lot and it would, I thought it would be cool because I'd be able to get her accessories. It was really cool that I was able to get her some fashion designs made by a Costa Rican fashion designer. So she's, like I said, one of the very few dolls that actually has a legit backstory. And I'll think of little things here and there for my dolls. Like there might be like a reason that one of my dolls has a scratch on their face or something like that. Like I'll come up with a little story in my mind, but none of them have like a character development. That's just not my thing. More of more of it for me is is what is the sentiment sentimentality sentimentality whatever the word would be attached to that doll for me because I place a lot of sentimental value in my dolls. So that's just one of the things like I realized one day because people will ask me a lot of times, did you name the doll? Did you sometimes I don't even name them because it's just that's not what it's about for me. It's more about um like I said, the sentimental reason behind the doll or that I just really like the way the doll looks. So that was one of my big epiphanies is that, you know what, I'm not a backstory person and that's okay. I think I, it's still okay to be a doll collector and not have to name every single doll you have or not have a backstory for every single doll. Number five, and this is a more recent epiphany for me, um, is that I prefer dolls without the neck joint. So here I've got two Popovi Sisters dolls and Quetzal in the pink here, she has a neck joint. And while I really love the extra poseability that it allows, um, when you look at that versus my Cuckoo here that has a solid neck, the solid neck is just a lot more elegant and it's a lot more beautiful and you're losing a little bit of posability, but you're gaining with that some elegance and it's just a beautiful sculpt and I feel like having the joint 
here on this doll interrupts the beautiful sculpting and the beautiful lines of the doll. And so that's, like I said, something that I have just kind of realized recently. The same thing with my Pasha Pasha dolls, the Simply Beautiful dolls. I love the simple neck that they have. They've got a long, beautiful, elegant neck as compared to, you know, the um, just the mini dolls that have the, the jointed necks. And so that's a personal preference thing for me when I ordered my tender creation doll I ordered her with a solid neck and I just I think I just prefer it and it's like I said again it's something more recent for me and I like that the doll artists have so many different options out there for everybody um, but it's just one option that I've realized I really think I prefer this body too because of the long um, elegance uninterrupted neck and the sculpting that you get to enjoy from that. So that is a recent one for me is that I prefer dolls without the extra neck joints. My number four epiphany is that I would always prefer to have an artist full set to getting a blank or a factory painted doll. Now I had this epiphany probably, I don't remember if it was 2015 or 2016, but what happened is Nikki Britt did a pre-order for her mouselings and you could order artist um, set mouselings and, or you could order the factory ones. And of course the artist full set costs a little more. And I ordered the factory ones. And when I got them in, I realized, you know, I would have much rather have had the artist full set. And ever since then, I have always, if artist full set is an option for me, I always go for it because I realized at that point, like I would much rather have the artist full vision of the doll. That's the whole point for me. Um, of collecting the dolls you know I'm trying to I want to support the artist and I want to enjoy my dolls and I find that I enjoy them so much more when the artist has really breathed the, the full life into them and two examples of this are my Tamakin Space Ife and I will be getting um, I will be ordering the Naora and the Khan and probably a sob in their upcoming sale. And the thing about it is, at a minimum, I like for the artist to have painted the doll. But when I can get a full set like this with the clothing, shoes, wig, everything, that's so exciting for me. Same thing with this um, Napalm Dolls Hush. I have a Hush, but it wasn't painted by the artist. It wasn't an artist's full set, but this Hush was, and she was available um, through an art gallery. And I wound up buying her because I just love Hush so much. And the fact that she was an artist's full set that was like it just blew me away so that is something that I always try to keep in mind when I'm buying a doll that's why I don't pre-order dolls as much as I used to I try to wait because a lot of artists will do special one-off artist editions and things like that and so I often try to just wait until they release one of those and I'll try to get try to buy those or get in on it and so that's and that's just something I've learned along the way of doll collecting is that I get a lot more enjoyment out of a doll when it is an artist full set now that's not to say I don't change their clothes out and stuff because I do but a lot of times you know I'll put them back in their artist full set for display. So that's something that I learned and it's something now that I try to stick to just because like I said, I know that I'm gonna enjoy it more if I'm able to get that artist full set. My number three epiphany is that I prefer dolls with more unusual faces as opposed to dolls with classically beautiful faces. And what do I mean by classically beautiful? Like for example, the Tender Creation dolls, they all have supermodel, striking, classically beautiful faces. But what do I mean by unusual? Well, first of all, Novgorod, this is a beautiful doll. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying she's not beautiful, but she's not that classic beauty, like supermodel sort of looks. She is a gorgeous doll in a different way. She has so much character in her face and I really just love this doll so much. I love this sculpt. I love everything about her. And so that's one of those examples of that. Another example of that are the Pasha Pasha dolls. You know, they have very strong features. They have very, um, they're very different the way that they look, but they're still gorgeous. They're very beautiful. They don't just have that classical sort of beauty that some other dolls in the past have. Another one that I can think of that all other dolls look like pure supermodels are the integrity dolls. You know, they all have that sort of 
to me it's more it's almost generic it's like kind of a generic look and don't get me wrong again they're beautiful too but I find myself more drawn to these dolls that have a more unusual or less classically beautiful sort of look like these strong features for the Pasha Pasha dolls or you know Novgorod's face I even think the Popovi dolls are some of them have very unusual and striking faces like magpie like that's not a classically beautiful face in my opinion so I just kind of prefer that and I've realized that maybe in the last year or so is when I kind of realized that and I don't remember I might have been looking at Elowen and Prudence I've always liked my Robert Tonner Prudence better than Elowen and Elowen is a more classical beauty where Prudence has like a chubbier face and she's cute but she's not like classically gorgeous like Elowen is and I've always liked her better and so that's something that I've really realized over the past probably like I said past year or two that I really prefer the unusual faces to the classically beautiful ones number two on my list is that dolly disappointment can be very real um, and what do I mean by that I see a lot of people they'll go online and they'll say I'm devastated that so-and-so sold out and I'm devastated because of this and, and and it seems a little extreme but at the same time the disappointment can be very real if you've got your heart set on something and it either sells out or you're not able to get it and so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of that one of this is one of those is this Blythe outfit I got this is from Moshi Moshi Studios I tried a couple of times to buy outfits from this designer and was too late and was really bummed out about it and um, but finally uh, I was able to get one and so like I just kept at it and I kept trying and it was really awesome to be able to get one of her outfits like I said because I've been following her and I really love her outfits I love the style that she does and so but I was very disappointed the first couple go rounds when I was just not able to purchase anything from her I've also had that same disappointment with a couple of other Blythe designers which I have not yet been able to get any clothing from but you know I know to keep at it one of the things though that you should never do when you have that disappointment is don't take that frustration out on the artist and an example of that that I've seen recently is with Maddie Bear Dolls you know she put Elle up for pre-order she's a new artist and she had her limited I can't remember if it was 40 or 50 dolls because as a new artist you know she needs to kind of fill out how much can she handle at one time and what what is it going to be like and there were people leaving some nasty comments on her Instagram about how she did the pre-order all wrong and it should have been this and that and the other and I don't think that's ever cool like that is not cool to go attack an artist because you weren't able to get something that you wanted other people were just faster you know people logged in and they were able to grab the stuff faster like I said there's a couple other Blythe designers I was logged in I was carding things and trying to check out but other people got checked out before me and so I missed out on those items but I didn't go attack the designer because of that it's not their fault you know they don't they have a limited number of things to sell and an artist should have control over how much of their product is out on the marketplace so that being said like I understand that the disappointment can be very real I have experienced it myself and you know even as as long as I've been buying there's things that I've you know I've tried and tried to get and I've never been able to get one and so that being said like it can it, there's there's so much worse things that can happen to you that have happened to me in my life other than just not being able to buy something that I wanted to get but you know you have to kind of temper your expectations I guess or just when something disappointing like that happens you know try not to let it get you too down because just kind of look at the other things you have that's what I always say I'm like okay well you didn't get this but look at this other thing that you have or sometimes I'll do a replacement purchase <laughs> like I'll buy something to make myself feel better which maybe not necessarily the way you want to go but anyway I just it, it was an epiphany to me that like because I was looking at people saying these things like how devastated they were about things and to me that seemed a little extreme but then I realized you know that disappointment can be very real especially when you've got your heart set on something and you've been looking forward to something and you're not able to get it even though you try your best so that has been one that I've also had more recently all right the number one epiphany I've had is that inexpensive dolls thrill me just as much as an expensive doll and I want to show you guys an example here this is one of the cheapest dolls I have in my collection it's a cherry Mary muffin I got her for about 50 cents 
I don't remember where, I think it was a thrift store, maybe it was the flea market. And y'all, I cannot describe to you how excited I was to find her. I love Cherry Mary Muffin dolls. You can still get them very inexpensively on eBay, like less than 10 bucks, or you can get a lot of them for around 20 bucks. I love them, I think they have the sweetest faces. I had one when I was a kid, um, which I still have. It wasn't Cherry Mary Muffin, I have had a different one, but from the same line. But I just love this doll, and I was so thrilled when I found her. I brought her home, I cleaned her up. She still smells a little bit like cherries, and so I just really love her. This is the most expensive doll in my collection. This is a Pasha Pasha full set. This is my full set Loki. I also really love this doll. I would not have spent the money that I spent on her if I didn't really love her. But I think the point that I'm making here is that you don't have to have a lot of money to find joy in your doll collecting. You can, you know, like I said, this doll was an amazing find for me at 50 cents. And even if I wanted to get one on eBay, they wouldn't be that much more than 50 cents. They're not that expensive. And so I think that if you love dolls and you have this general love of things, um, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much money you're willing to spend. You can get just as much joy out of something like this as you can out of a beautiful full artist set like this. And I think that's really important to point out because I think a lot of people feel like, well, they, they can't be valid doll collectors if they're not spending, they're, if they don't have really expensive dolls in their collection. That is absolutely not true. I think if you, it doesn't matter what kind of dolls you collect, if they're 50 cent dolls from the flea market or if they're expensive high-end artist dolls, you know, you, your collecting is valid. And as a matter of fact, I can see myself in the future whenever I retire and I don't have the same, you know, sort of income level and health insurance and things like that in the future, I will probably shift back to collecting this sort of doll primarily because, you know, it'll be what I can afford. And I love them. I love them. They bring me just as much joy. There's something very satisfying about buying a vintage doll and cleaning it up and you know just really enjoying something from your childhood and I think everybody's got dolls from their childhood that you can find either at your local flea market or that you can find on eBay for very inexpensively and you can get them clean them up and add them to your collection so I think that's something I just that that's a big you know epiphany I probably had I want to say I had that three or four years ago it's like I just I love every type of doll you know whether whether they're you know one of the least expensive dolls in my collection all the way up to the most expensive I get the same sort of joy from fixing up an old doll and adding her to the collection as I do from buying you know a beautiful artist full set so that being said I think that's one of the more important things that I've realized over time is that you know while right now I'm able to support artists and I'm able, able to support their amazing work, I'm going to, but in the future, you know, my, when I retire or, you know, God forbid I lose my job or something like that, I'm still going to be able to be a doll collector and I will be able to have just as much joy in collecting a different type of doll than what I primarily collect now. So. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that you enjoyed the epiphanies um, that I've laid out for you. Do you have any, did you ever come to any realization throughout your doll collecting, um, I would say career, but maybe I should say your doll collecting hobby that were kind of like light bulb moments for you? If you have, please leave them for me in the comments below. I'm sure I have others as well, but you know, I just wanted to give you guys 10 of the ones that were the most impactful for me that I could think of. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up. Please be sure to subscribe if you're not subscribed and we will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye. I wanna say a huge thank you to all my patrons from Patreon. Lindsay S, Leah W, Jenny C, Doreen Z, Janice H, Mercedes W, Angela E, Cindy K, Bear Sunflower, Diane B, and Kelly L. Your support means so much. To find out how you can help support this channel, please check the link in the description of this video. Thanks so much.